<laughs> in front of her whole class? Yeah. Very good. I'm sure that they had a good chuckle out of that, huh? Yeah. That's okay. We all do it. All right. Um, let's go ahead and head over to Google Classroom. I'm going to present my screen. We do have a new um, story. We're going to kind of go back to the format of we read a story, we do a couple of the activities, all of that stuff. Morning, Skylar. So, uh, yeah. Oh, I guess I have to finish sharing my screen. Sorry. Okay, there we go. Now on Google Classroom, you have and should have a new assignment that's called Feathered Friend, which when I first saw this title, I was like, what does this have to do with technology? Because our unit is all about technology. So before we even open it, does anybody have any idea how, I mean, if you think of a feathered friend, what do you think of? A bird. A bird. Any a idea? Bird. Yeah. Any idea how a bird could potentially be technology? It Maybe it delivers messages. Maybe it's like the beginning of technology because there used to be pigeons, right, that would uh, deliver things. Maybe they help type something. So yeah, there's a couple of ideas. None of them are the correct one, <laughs> but that's kind of what I thought too. Like maybe it's going to be about pigeon like pigeons delivering way. things. Yeah, but it is not. So we're gonna uh, look at the background of this. And uh, um, none of you guys are really that close. Sorry. Yeah. So let's go ahead and get our story opened up. Well, maybe an app like Twitter. That's a good one. Not correct. But that would have been a good thought process. All righty. Let's get the story opened up, and then we'll look at the background information, look at some of the vocabulary, read the story, all the fun things. That is true. Okay, mine's taking a while to load, so let's... Hope it loads. Um, uh, I don't know, but this I think is a canary. I don't know what bird you're talking about, though. Okay. Tweety Bird? Tweety Bird is like. In cartoons. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah, Tweety Bird is the cartoon bird. Okay, so go ahead and get that opened up. Looks like a lot of you guys are getting there, or you're looking at the Google Meet, which is fine. Just make sure you also have it open so that you can fill out the information. Give me about 30 more seconds, and then we will get going on it. I'm going to check my attendance really quick while you guys get that opened up. That's pretty good. Okay. I think we're good. Um, so this is called Feathered Friend. It's a short story. Um, so it's not a news article. It seems to be a, uh, a fictional story from what I could tell. But based on a true event, right? A true uh, thing that they used to do, okay? So let's look at the background. Um, I will play it, so it might be a little bit loud if you're online, so maybe turn your volume down. I'm gonna start playing the background information in three, two, one. Oh, I missed the play, there we go. Feathered Friend by Arthur C. Clarke. Short story, background. This story was written during the 1950s, a time of growth and technological advancement in the United States. The possibility of space exploration created a feeling of immense potential. This optimism about the future influenced all areas of the arts, especially popular literature, in what is now called the golden age of science fiction. About the author. With more than 100 million copies of his books in print worldwide, Arthur C. Clarke born 1917, died 2008, 
may have been the most successful science fiction writer of all time. He is known for combining his knowledge of technology and science with touches of poetry. Clark once said, the only way of finding the limits of the possible is by going beyond them into the impossible. Okay. Did that give you any information about what the story is going to be about? No. Not really. Um, so we're still kind of like, we don't know. There's a bird. We have that idea, but we don't really have much else to go off of. Even the background information wasn't super helpful on this one. It did say it was written during the 1950s. In the 1950s, did they have cell phones, computers? They did have some form of television, yeah. Um, yeah, they had really big cameras. Yoshi had at least. So, uh, yeah, they did. They did not have very advanced technology yet, but they're kind of working towards it. So that's kind of the time period that this takes place in. So I'm gonna just hide this top part. Let's look over at the making meaning and look at some of the vocabulary before we read it. Okay. So we will encounter. Or you, we, both of us, all of us, will encounter the following words as we read Feathered Friend. Before reading it, note how familiar you are with each word, and then rank the words in order from familiar, number one. So if you're the most familiar with a word, that's your number one. And if you are least familiar with a word and you're like, I don't know what that means, that's a five. Okay, so let's go ahead and open up this chart. And we're going to label these one through five. And it's based off of what you know. If you kind of don't really know a lot of them, that's okay. It's all right. Which one is it? Um, Comsight vocabulary under making meaning. It's our first one. So we have the words pathetically, distressed, mournfully, apologetically, and lamented. So what you're going to do is put a one through five on there. So I, let's say, I, I feel like this might be for a lot of you guys. The word lamented might be your least familiar, right? Wait, wait, wait. Can, can it wants you to do a one through five, not the same number on, on two of them. So if you don't know a couple of them, that's okay. Just put them as like your three, four, and five. So what do we mean, what is the same thing? They seem kind of similar, so maybe do them as close numbers. So I would. I'm just going to assume, I don't know if this is true or not, that most of you guys are going to say that lamented is one of the words that you do not know at all. I don't even. So that would be a five because you just don't know what the word means at all. Yep. And then for me, the one that I know the best, I guess, would be apologetically. I know exactly what that means. So I, oh, whoa, what did I just say? <laughs> so I would put apologetically as a one because I'm most familiar with it. So you want to label these one through five from most familiar to least familiar with the words. And we're not even going to go over what they mean yet, because as we read it, we'll stop and review that. So take about a minute, get that one through five in there, please. Is she filming up? Yeah. Alright. So, you got it? Okay, you guys all done? Let me check. So, ready? Looks like we're getting done with that. Good, good, good. One through five. Alright. So, hopefully, you've got your one through five done there. And now let's go ahead and close that and read the story. Do we still have a guess on what this might be about? Any thoughts yet? Uh, um, 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 a bird that's almost dead. Yeah. Um, a bird that is all those words. All right. All right. Okay, well, 
we're going to go ahead and uh, listen to our story. We'll probably stop it a couple times. It's about, no, it's about nine and a half minutes. Um, we'll stop it a couple of times, especially at the vocabulary words, just to review the vocabulary words. And then every once in a while to uh, do a little bit of comprehension to make sure that we're understanding where the story is going. Sound good? All righty. Um, I'm going to play it. So if your headphones are in and it's too loud, turn it down. I'm going to play it in three, two, one. Feathered Friend by Arthur C. Clarke. To the best of my knowledge, there's never been a regulation that forbids one to keep pets in the space station. No one ever thought it was necessary. And even had such a rule existed, I am quite certain that Sven Olsen would have ignored it. With a name like that, you will picture Sven at once as a six-foot-six Nordic giant, built like a bull and with a voice to match. Had this been so, his chances of getting a job in space would have been very slim. Actually, he was a wiry little fellow, like most of the early spacers, and managed to qualify easily for the 150-pound bonus that kept so many of us on a reducing diet. Sven was one of our best construction men and excelled at the tricky and specialized work of collecting assorted girders as they floated around in a free fall, making them do the slow motion three-dimensional ballet that would get them into their right positions and fusing the pieces together when they were precisely dovetailed into the intended pattern. It was a skilled and difficult job for a spacesuit is not the most convenient of garbs in which to work. However, Sven's team had one great advantage over the construction gangs you see putting up skyscrapers down on Earth. They could step back and admire their handiwork without being abruptly parted from it by gravity. All right, so based off of this, what sort of job does it sound like Sven has? A space job. A space job. So he's in. He's an yeah, an astronaut. And we're still. This is about a bird. Where do you think the bird fits into this? Uh, later on. Later on, maybe. Who knows, right? I. Oh, really it really didn't give that much information. But what do we know about Sven as far as his physical appearance? What does he look he's like? Broken and broken Not that Sven, but that's good. That's a reindeer. <laughs> yeah. So how how big is Sven? He's not that short, but well, I mean, how do you, are we sure he's a bird? But Sven. I'm pretty sure he's a person who is an astronaut. Well, that's what it says you'll picture him as, but what does it say he actually is down in the paragraph? 150 pounds. It's not very big. Like, no. Yeah, exactly. So, 150 pounds is not a very big dude. At all. So he's kind of small, fits into small places, and that helps him do his job pretty well. Okay? So we are on paragraph four. Here we go. Don't ask me why Sven wanted a pet or why he chose the one he did. I'm not a psychologist, but I must admit that his selection was very sensible. Clarabelle weighed practically nothing. Her food requirements were tiny, and she was not worried, as most animals would have been, by the absence of gravity. I first became aware that Clarabelle was aboard when I was sitting in the little cubby hole, laughingly called my office, checking through my lists of technical stores to decide what items we'd be running out of next. When I heard the musical whistle beside my ear, I thought that it had come over the station intercom and waited for an announcement to follow. It didn't. Instead, there was a burst of song 
that made me look up with such a start that I forgot all about the angle beam just behind my head. When the stars had ceased to explode before my eyes, I had my first view of Clarabelle. She was a small yellow canary, hanging in the air as motionless as a hummingbird, and with much less effort, for her wings were quietly folded along her sides. We stared at each other for a minute. Then, before I had quite recovered my wits, she did a curious kind of backward loop I'm sure no earthbound canary had ever managed, and departed with a few leisurely flicks. It was quite clear that she'd already learned how to operate in the absence of gravity, and did not believe in doing unnecessary work. Sven didn't confess to her ownership for several days, and by that time it no longer mattered, because Clarabelle was a general pet. He had smuggled her up on the last ferry from Earth when he came back from leave, partly, he claimed, out of sheer scientific curiosity. He wanted to see just how a bird would operate when it had no weight, but could still use its wings. Okay, so... Then came back up to space, and what did he bring along with him? A bird, a canary. A canary, a little bird. A canary is the um, the one up at the top, this yellow, little tiny bird. What was his reasoning for bringing in Clarabelle, the bird? He, to do a he was kind of doing a science experiment, right? Just to see how a bird would handle space. And then what kind of happened with the bird? The bird back there. Well, we're getting there. Yeah. Well, that's on the next line. It says it in the next line. But uh, before that, how did the bird do? Was it like bird? Yeah. Did people start to like the bird? No. Nobody really knew about the bird. Then they started seeing it around. And then what? Any ideas? No. It talks about her kind of becoming like a general pet. Like, everybody was just kind of like, oh, she's around. Well, guess we'll take care of her. So she just kind of became part of the spaceship that they're in. Okay? Now we're on paragraph eight. Um, if it went outside the spacecraft, probably it still needs oxygen, yeah. But inside the spacecraft, they have oxygen. Yeah. I don't know how they would fit a bird into a spacesuit, but maybe they could do it. Uh -huh. All right, paragraph eight. Clarabelle thrived and grew fat. On the whole, we had little trouble concealing our guest when VIPs from Earth came visiting. A space station has more hiding places than you can count. The only problem was that Clarabelle got rather noisy when she was upset, and we sometimes had to think fast to explain the curious peeps and whistles that came from ventilating shafts and storage bulkheads. There were a couple of narrow escapes. But then, who would dream of looking for a canary in a space station? We were now on 12-hour watches, which was not as bad as it sounds, since you need little sleep in space. Though, of course, there is no day and night when you are floating in permanent sunlight, it was still convenient to stick to the terms. Certainly, when I woke that morning... It felt like 6 a.m. on Earth. I had a nagging headache and vague memories of fitful, disturbed dreams. It took me ages to undo my bunk straps, and I was still only half awake when I joined the remainder of the duty crew in the mess. Breakfast was unusually quiet, and there was one seat vacant. Where's Sven? I asked, not very much caring. He's looking for Clarabelle, someone answered. Says he can't find her anywhere. She usually wakes him up. Before I could retort that she usually woke me up, too, Sven came in through the doorway, and we could see at once that something was wrong. He slowly opened his hand, and there lay a tiny bundle of yellow feathers with two clenched claws sticking pathetically up into the air. Okay. What happened? 
Clarabelle um, died? Yeah, it seems like Clarabelle has died, um, which is sad. So Sven, uh, well, let's read the sentence really quick. Uh, he slowly opens up his hand, and there lay a tiny bundle of yellow feathers, Clarabelle, with two clenched claws sticking pathetically up in the air. So we need to figure out what this word pathetically means. It's one of our vocabulary words. Without, uh, without clicking on it, what I does that Yeah, so don't answer. Go ahead, Charlie. Okay. Uh, visibly? Yeah. Uh, visibly? Uh, visibly? Uh, kind of stupidly? Like, 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys are all kind of on the right track. Any other ideas? It's kind of sad, yeah. Yeah, you get, yeah, you're getting closer. Like, kind of sad. So, pathetically is in a way that causes someone to feel pity, to feel bad for you. So saying something pathetically is like, you give off this sad vibe. So this poor little bird has its claws clenched just like in the air, like sadly. Okay. Teachers, please excuse the interruption. Students, there will be no orchestra this afternoon. Please excuse the interruption. There will be no orchestra this afternoon. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, poor bird is dead. Um, we're going to read a little bit more, and then we'll look at these next three uh, vocabulary words. So we're on paragraph 13. What happened? We asked, all equally distressed. I don't know, said Sven mournfully. I just found her like this. Let's have a look at her, said Jack Duncan, our cook, doctor, dietitian. We all waited in hushed silence while he held Clarabelle against his ear in an attempt to detect any heartbeat. Presently, he shook his head. I can't hear anything, but that doesn't prove she's dead. I've never listened to a canary's heart, he added rather apologetically. Give her a shot of oxygen, suggested somebody, pointing to the green batted emergency cylinder in its recess beside the door. Everyone agreed that this was an excellent idea, and Clarabelle was tucked snugly into a face mask that was large enough to serve as a complete oxygen tent for her. Okay, let's just look at some vocabulary words first. So, at this point, can they tell if she's dead or not? No, she's probably yeah. passed out. Yeah, we don't know for sure. Um, so, he, uh, they asked him, what happened? And they're all distressed. What does it mean to be distressed? Uh, not stressed. Kind of. Maddie said upset. It's kind of upset. Yeah. Like you're all a little bit like, oh my gosh, what happened? You're like stressed out about it, basically. Um, so troubled, upset, things along those lines. Worried is a good one, too. Um, so they're all worried about Clarabelle and if she's dead. And then Sven says, I don't know. And he's very mournful. What does mournful mean? Like surprised, shocked. Shocked. Surprised. If you think that, yes, full of mourn, yes, but what does mourning mean? <laughs> what does it mean to mourn something? No, it means to be sad. Mournfully means that you're sad about it. It's grief or sadness. So when someone dies, usually you're mourning them. You're sad, you have a lot of grief about it, and things like that. Yeah. Um, that's what mournfully means. And then our next vocabulary word is apologetically. This one I think we can guess. What does it mean to be apologetic? So being like, I'm sorry that this happened. Yeah, you're basically saying you're sorry. Everybody feels sorry that this is happening. They're regretting that this poor animal is dead. So yeah, there's some of our vocabulary words. Um, we are on paragraph 18. And at this point, they're giving Clarabelle a little bit of oxygen to see if that'll help revive her, right? So here we go. To our delighted surprise, 
She revived at once. Beaming broadly, Sven removed the mask, and she hopped onto his finger. She gave her a series of Come to the cookhouse, boys, trills. Then promptly keeled over again. I don't get it, lamented Sven. What's wrong with her? She's never done this before. For the last few minutes, something had been tugging at my memory. My mind seemed to be very sluggish that morning, as if I was still unable to cast off the burden of sleep. I felt that I could do with some of that oxygen. But before I could reach the mask, understanding exploded in my brain. I whirled on the duty engineer and said urgently, Jim, there's something wrong with the air. That's why Clarabelle's passed out. I just remembered that miners used to carry canaries down to warn them of gas. Okay, have you guys ever heard of that before? No. So back when um well i mean they probably still do it but they probably use a different system now instead of birds but um when miners so people that worked in the mines they would go underground and mine for coal or gold whatever they were mining for um there's a lot of toxic gases that are down there when you're mining so you're smacking and like using the axe on the tunnels and it lets out gases that could potentially kill you um, it's not great for you to be a miner, to be honest. So they would bring down little canaries, and if the gas that was being let out was deadly, the canaries would pass out and die, and the miners would know, okay, we got to get out of this tunnel because we're all next. We're going to die if we stay down here. So this little bird has passed out in the space station, so what can they assume is wrong inside the space station? Yeah, they're not healthy. Yeah, yeah that the air in there is not... That's Good. Like yeah, that's why the guy woke up with a headache. Something is wrong with the air inside the space station. And the fact that the canary keeps passing out is giving them that hint. Okay, so here we go. We're going to keep going. Yeah, we are on, where are we at? 22? Paragraph 22. Here we go. Nonsense, said Jim. The alarms would have gone off. We've got duplicate circuits operating independently. Uh, the second alarm circuit isn't connected up yet, his assistant reminded him. That shook Jim. He left without a word, while we stood arguing and passing the oxygen bottle around like a pipe of peace. He came back ten minutes later with a sheepish expression. It was one of those accidents that couldn't possibly happen. We've had one of our rare eclipses by Earth's shadow that night. Part of the air purifier had frozen up, and the single alarm in the circuit had failed to go off. Half a million dollars worth of chemical and electronic engineering had let us down completely. Without Clarabel, we should soon have been slightly dead. So now, if you visit any space station, don't be surprised if you hear a snatch of birdsong. There's no need to be alarmed. On the contrary, in fact, it will mean that you're being doubly safeguarded at practically no extra expense. Okay. So there's a story about Clarabel. Um, if this author writes science fiction, do you think that this is a true story? Yeah, it could be based off of a true story, but he also wrote this in the 1950s, and we'd barely been to space yet. We didn't really know a lot about space. So this is kind of a futuristic thing that he has written. So at this point, they wouldn't really know all of the things that they know about space as much as he had in depth. So this is probably a lot of fiction, kind of made up stuff based off of some scientific fact that they already know about. So, based on that, we're going to go ahead and uh, look at our first read chart and fill out some of these um, boxes. We've done this before a lot. So, let's go ahead and get that opened up. We'll do it kind of together, kind of separate. Um, let's start by adding our title, which is Feathered Friends. 
Um, we're going to do the comprehension check too, at least. Probably finish with that, maybe. Depends on the time. It's only 8.30, though. We have a half hour. Okay, so go ahead and get that open, get that typed out. Um, guess we were signed up at probably 9 30 to 10 30 based on the times. Yeah. Okay, can you close that? Yeah, I'm going to change the times of the lesson tomorrow because usually I do math at 10, so I'm just going to push it back. So, yeah, I'll leave you like a note that says, like, what they can do. Yeah, all that stuff. All righty, um, let's do our notice one. This is our who, what, when, where, and why of the story. So let's start with the who. Who are these main characters in the story? That Clarabelle the Canary. Clarabelle. I'm going to say Clarabelle the Canary because I like that. Clarabelle the Canary. And then who's her owner? Let's just go with these two people. Who owns her, technically? Jim. Jim is the engineer, Sven. Good. Yoshi, wake up. Close, yeah. So it's kind of about Clarabelle and Sven. Sven wants a pet. Brings Clarabelle along. Huh? I know, right? And he kind of snuck her aboard. He probably shouldn't have actually brought her, but it worked to their advantage on this one, right? So that's our who. What about what happens here? Um, everyone started to like, we were getting on the life of the bird, and then we just decided that the bird's very wild. Okay, so they like to start, or they start to like the bird. That's what I was going to write. And so they start to like the bird. They're like, all right, we'll take care of the bird. It's here. We can't just throw it out into space. That would be mean and probably kill it. Um, so after they are like, okay, we're going to take care of the bird, then what happens? What's the issue? What's the conflict? Gas complete sentences. So I say that again? The gas leak? The gas leak. Um, I want to I do not know a way for that to happen. I'm sorry. I mean, technically, there's no oxygen in space, so you wouldn't be able to breathe. Yeah. So, because the way that it works is they have to put on their spacesuits because the spacesuits have an oxygen tank for them to use. So, technically, they breathe just like they do on Earth because they've created an oxygen space for them to breathe in. I wonder if you could, like, I wonder if you would be able to breathe like you would be able to breathe. Like without a spacesuit? Mm -hmm. You would just. Choke. Like, kind of? Yeah, it, it's probably similar similar to drowning because you're not getting oxygen. Yeah. 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 Go for it. That's cool. Um, after the gas leak, what happens? Or during the gas leak, how do they know there's a gas leak? Yeah, Elijah, what's up? Mm 
If you went into space, you would freeze and lose air. Yeah. Yeah, it's cold in space and there's no air, so you freeze and can't breathe and you die up there if you don't have a space suit on. So yeah, it's not great. Um, so the gas is leaking into the place, uh, the space station. What happens? How do they know? What happens? Flare bell passes out. And basically saves them. Interesting. Um, then we need the where. Where did this happen? In space. In space. On a space station. Good. It does ask us when, but did it really talk about when? No. No, not really. It was written in the 1950s. Yeah, I mean, it was written in the 1950s, but that doesn't mean that the author was saying, oh, it's 1950, that he could have been writing for the future. So, as far as I remember, it, it doesn't say when. Did you, did you hear a when? I didn't hear a when. But we don't know for sure. Yep. We just don't know for sure when it was happening. I'll give you guys a second to write that out. And then we just have our Y. Okay, and then our last thing right there is why. Why did the people react the way that they did? So basically, they were very calm, yeah. They were calm. Um, what else? How do you think they felt when they realized that Clarabelle saved them? Happy? Grateful? Yeah. Marty, what do you think? Surprised? Yeah. Surprised too. So there's a lot of things. So they were surprised that the um that the uh, gas leak even happened. They were grateful that Clarabelle saved them. They were distressed by the fact that that even happened. So there's a lot of feelings that they were feeling, right? So go ahead and write a couple of those down. All right. After you guys get the who, what, when, where, and why typed out, yeah. Well, it's asking why did they react the way they, re they reacted. Yeah. Um, and then uh, in the annotate part, I'd like you to go back and highlight two important details from the story. Hmm. That's gross. Pickles are disgusting. Okay, take about three minutes, go back and highlight two important details from the story. Maybe some characters, maybe some events that happened, reactions. Okay, so take about two minutes to do that. Is it hot in here? No. I think I'm going to be later. Okay, I won't open the window just yet. But later today, just I'll show you. Yeah. All right. I, I, can I clean the messy? Well, 
we'll do it in a minute. Actually, we're probably not going to go over them. Probably, I, I just want to bring the last one that I have. All right, go ahead. Okay. Sounds good. Did anyone see that rocket up in the sky the other day? There was a rocket in the sky probably. Okay. Well, it really was. I saw it. But Area 51 is not real. It is. I mean, they say it is. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? I don't know if that's All right. Okay. Hopefully, you've got some stuff highlighted. You got to kind of keep going here. On the connect one down on the bottom, this is where we're connecting to ideas from other stories we might have read, technology, your own life. So, what are some connections we can make to this? Can we make any connections? Probably something. Any ideas? <laughs> what about space, though? We gotta connect it to like specific things. Okay, so Dallin saw a rocket in the sky. Let's see. That works, yeah. Um, can you connect it to our actual science unit that we are doing? What are we? Okay, you can connect it to model rockets. I'm gonna write this one down, but we're doing a whole unit on space and science. Okay. And see if you can get one more connection on your own. A canary. Do so, about. 30 more seconds here because again we just kind of kind of keep moving i got what? a question what's up what kind of bird what kind of bird is this it's a canary mm. Mm -hmm. Once you finish up the connections, uh, there is a small summary that you need to write, like you always do. Let's do a three to four sentence summary. Okay, so I'll give you guys a few minutes to do this summary because you can just copy and paste it later. So if you write a good summary here, you don't have to write one later because you do need to do that later as well. So, be finishing up this first read box. I'll give you guys until 8.50. That is four minutes. Okay. I'm going to check attendance while you guys are doing that. C A N A R Y. And cop more minutes.
Miss Joan. Yeah. When we're done, can we leave? No, we still have one more section to do. We're not done yet. Got about one more minute, and then I'll explain the last thing. And then once you're done with that last part, then you can head out. Okay, so hopefully you guys are finishing up that summary where you are done. Uh, you will probably just need to copy and paste it later. So the next thing that we're going to do is the comprehension check. And this is uh, five questions that you're going to do on your own just to see if you understood exactly what happened in the story. So there's five questions. I'd like you to write complete sentences, please, on your answers. It can be just one sentence, but you need to answer the questions. So, number one, for number one, yeah, but you can make it a complete sentence. The story took place at blank, yeah. So, number one, where does the story take place? Answer in a complete sentence. Number two, how does the narrator, whoever the person telling the story, how do they discover Clarabelle's presence, which means how do they know she's there? Number three, why did Sven bring Clarabelle on board? Number four, what causes Clarabelle to pass out? And then number five is where you're going to copy and paste your summary. So I know that you've written that summary. So that is what you're completing. Once you finish up those five questions, then you can head out. But make sure you complete this because I'm going to grade it so that I can make sure that you are understanding what was happening in the story. Should we have to have complete sentences?